I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler on this week's episode. We got a couple articles out of the Gator Country to kick things off, with one with David Wunderlich. Talking about what he wants to get out of this season, 2024, we also got an interview uh, with Ron Roberts uh, from Nick Marcinko on Gator Country as well. We'll talk about DeMarcus Bowman and his status at UCF at the moment. Mr. Five-Star Running Back, Will, how's that play out for the Stars arguments? Uh, and we'll wrap up with a challenge to the audience in honor of the NCAA uh, brackets being out. We want to get in on the fun here, so we'll throw out a challenge to the audience at the end of the show. Uh, before we kick off, Will, how's it going, man? Yeah, going really well. We're uh, chugging along on the magazine. We're uh, we're getting some stuff. My hard drive quit on me the other day, so I got to go get that uh, geek squatted so I can uh, I can get some of my stuff back. But uh, making good progress. I think it's interesting. You know, it's always sky is falling when you're when you're in the midst of a season like Florida had last year. And then you start to break it down. You're like, well, if that had gone right, and well, if that had gone right. And you start thinking about where Florida might be able to get some breaks this year that they didn't last year. So the interesting thing I think is going to be that as people read the magazine when it comes out, there's going to be a lot of glasses half full. There will certainly be some glasses half empty, but it's not going to be all glasses half empty. And and I'm happy about that. I'm happy that you know we're looking at things from the standpoint of trying to be fair in terms of, look, five and seven last year, there's not a lot to be really excited about, but I still think that there are some things and some trends and some other things that we've observed and can break down statistically and also from a film perspective to where Florida should be able to do some things in 2024 and hopefully surprise some people. Yeah, we'll uh, probably in the coming weeks keep an eye out for pre-orders here. We will announce everything on the show, but uh, we'll, we will keep people posted on that one for sure. All right, let's dump, jump right in here. David Wonderlich, Florida's 2024 football season must be one more time setting up for the future. And he says it that way. I, I, like, I love that headline, Will. I loved it because it, it really says it one more time, like, We've been rebuilding for quite a bit here. This is another rebuilding season we're staring at here. So this was one of the lines I like from the article. Now, I know no one wants to hear this. After three straight seasons with a losing final record, another year of building does not sound enticing. And Billy Napier himself will have some real difficulties with employment if the team doesn't make any kind of leap forward this season, much less next. But I'm planting this flag, Wonderlick says, a successful season is proving the team will be ready to make a big leap in 2025. Well, I tend to agree with this. I, this is exactly the way this is what I've been saying here uh, of late. You got a quarterback in DJ Lagway. That's really the centerpiece of this class and a lot of other young talent. Let's see how those guys uh, pan out. We've seen what happens when a coach leaves the school where there will be a tremendous amount of transfers and what we've spent the last couple of years building up toward this season to really set up this season and next. And uh, I, I do think that there has to be some development, some hope in those young players going forward. But if there are signs from those young players to set up a successful 2025, I, I do think that would be a successful season in 2024 as well. Yeah. I mean, the problem is, is that they really haven't set up for that kind of success to be seen in 2024. The, the way that the quarterback recruiting has gone with Austin Simmons and with, with uh, um, a kid out in Arizona state, can't remember his name. I should be able to remember his name. We say it every, we said it every, every, every four episodes, but uh, you know, those two quarterbacks from the recruiting perspective, that, that that's a little bit of a problem, obviously. I think the interesting thing in the article here by, by Dave Wonderlich is that he talks about, essentially Napier coming in telling us that we needed to be patient and then also um, and then being true to his word that we need to be patient and that, and that this is going to be a slow build. Now, I think you can have legitimate arguments and I do have legitimate arguments about whether that's the right way to go about things. Um, Dave even says in the article, he talks about it being sort of, this is year two because the first year was year zero and those sorts of things, which actually that argument held a lot of water when Florida had the number three recruiting class in the country for this 2024 recruiting class. When that recruiting class falls to 15th or 16th or wherever it ends up, well now that all of a sudden becomes a problem because 
you no longer are sort of saying, well, usually you get that bump in recruiting in year two and we got it in year three. So we can start talking about, you know, a year zero and those sorts of things. I think, um, you know, the, the reality is, is that the hope you talk about comes from either recruiting or comes from winning. And if recruiting is going to sit at 14th, 15th, 16th, then you're going to have to win some games. And the over and under is five and a half. So how many games he needs to win, I think, is a more um, is a more interesting conversation than um, than do we need to see development on the field? I mean, look, if Florida goes four and eight, I don't know that it's going to matter whether whether we see a wide receiver step up like are you really gonna be are you really worried about the program losing the players who a coach has brought in and they've gone six and seven five and seven and four and eight they go seven and six now we're having a different conversation obviously if they go nine and three i think napier's probably getting an extension so there there are all sorts of different machinations that are going on um the problem is, is a lot of times coaches actually take a step back in year three that year two is when sort of the previous recruiting classes from the previous coach come to maturity and are able to win some games and then year three is when there's a dearth of experience the transfer portals changed that a little bit though floor has gone pretty heavy when it comes to experience in the transfer portal and i think that probably bodes well for the Gators in 2024, at least in terms of being able to have much, much more experience out on the field than they had last year. Do we, do we really see a major difference between a five and seven and seven and six? I know it's technically a winning record on paper. You probably got another win or two in there, but I, yeah, you know, I had this thought this year. We had the five win season this year, obviously, but were we, were you super upset that we didn't end up in some mid-level the lower tier bowl game getting our face beat in by an Oregon, the Oregon states of the world. Was that, did that terribly upset you this year? Or I, I kind of five and seven, six and six, seven. It's kind of your, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, All right. Really well, Nick Newton says business. we got to go 10 and two or Napier's gone. So that's good that we've, that's not, we've established I'm, I'm that. I'm saying <laughs> like, I really think it's about like to put a specific record on it like that is, is what I, this is where I lean toward Wonderlick's argument. I, I that's it's hard for me to put a specific record on it because again, if the five wins, if, if the seven, if we're five and seven, and the five wins are against nobody teams that we look sloppy against, and it's not really a pretty sight, and then the seven losses we're just getting crushed by anybody remotely de- decent. That's a different conversation than a five and seven team who's playing really well and maybe they came up short a few times i i, I don't know i i don't think it's a record thing I, I think I, I think it is absolutely going to be how does this team look are we trending do we feel like we're trending in the right direction heading I, into I think, 2025 i think the team you need to actually look at is auburn I, I think hugh freeze has come in there he's recruited better than napier he's got a history of winning in the sec and if he ends up turning around to auburn in year two and you're sitting there still struggling in year three at florida like how do you look at those two things and resolve it and go well we're building differently than they are over at auburn it's the same damn program i mean you got auburn with alabama that they have to overcome every year florida with georgia that they got to overcome every year it's pretty well established the way you do that is you recruit your butt off and you got to have an offense that that's going to be able to scare people and so to me I, I think it always comes down to compared to what so i don't just say you fire a coach because y- you you're tired of that coach i think you have to have an alternative that is more attractive than that coach so if you look at the candidates and go no one's more attractive than billy napier right now sure then you give him an extra year if you or give him the fourth year if if you look out there and there's somebody just sitting there that you go that guy's going to be a star you make the change because you you anticipate that that star is going to be able to hold on to a lot of the guys on the roster because of the gravitas that he brings in when nick saban went from the miami dolphins to alabama like that was a huge huge win for the crimson tide irrespective of whether they had to make a coaching change or not right like and if nick saban had put out feelers the year before that he was interested in going to alabama (laughs) They would have absolutely jettisoned Mike Shula a year early to get Nick Saban in there. And I think, so that's really the question is it comes down to compared to what, I think that's the same thing when we talk about success for the year. Again, I think if you start out the year one and six, DJ Lagway comes in and you end up five and seven and Lagway looks awesome. Well, that's a different story than if you start out the season six and one and you end up six and six and Lagway doesn't even play, right? And, and you just have no idea what's coming the next year. Or right. let's say you start out five and two and you end up the year five and seven and because you lose the last five games of the year. 
it's going to be hard to justify keeping a coach around who's had two five game losing streaks to end the last two seasons. Like they're irrespective of growth and all that sort of stuff. Like urban Meyer in the swamp Kings documentary was talking about losing three sec games, mm -hmm. his first year there and fearing for his life in terms of fearing for his career in terms of being kicked out of Gainesville. You lose five straight games to lose two straight years. And that also means you're not beating your rivals, right? Cause it means you haven't beaten Georgia or Florida state either of those years. That's a, that's a rough pill for people to swallow. So I get what Dave's, I get what Dave wonder saying. I agree. It's not what people want to hear that 2024 is a rebuilding year. I think everybody's sort of come around to it. I mean, we can see that in terms of the interest people have in the program, how they're talking about the program, what they hope to see, those sorts of things. But again, I go back to you got to deliver hope somewhere. And so the but, hope either has to be – Go ahead, finish. Well, I was going to say the hope either has to be that we now have a stud quarterback heading into 2025 or – the hope has to be that recruiting has significantly picked up in 2020 and for the 2025 class. Those are really the only two things that I look at and other than wins and go, where am I deriving hope? Because recruiting does not suggest that they're going to be beating the Georges and the Alabamas of the world. The offensive you, play call. You don't have to, you no longer have to, to make the playoff though. This is the perspective shift that we also have to keep in mind. If, if the, if we were in the old world, which as of now was last year, we are now in this new world of a 12 and in two years of 14 team playoff. You're talking about being a top 12 team in the country. Well, top 14 team in the country, the road to the path to that is much easier than catching the Georgias of the world. That's not really the, com the you, conversation you, you for winning you... national titles is catching the Georgias of the world, but getting into the playoff, getting in the tournaments, which is the step you would take into that tournament. It, that's a step you would need to take before getting to the, the level of Georgia. But talking about Georgia at this point, well, like, can we beat Kentucky? Damn it. Can we handle, can we handle our business in those? Like I, it needs to be a progression. There needs to be a prog progression. So it's not, I feel like in these arguments, I come across as, uh, as soft against the, the Napier and everything. And I, I'm not trying to sound that way, but if it's as easy as Nick Saban, just go out and hire Nick Saban. Why the hell haven't we done that? Uh, in 2013 or, or, or 2017 or like we haven't done that in other times. So why is that going to happen now? And at some point, that's that's the only part I'm looking at the challenge. So when we talk about from a record standpoint, I, I look at five and seven, six. We're not hanging banners for seven and five records around here either. For like any of those things in the middle, that's not what the Florida Gators are going to talk about anyway. It, it, it really is. Do you have that team that's in position to, I, I would say 2025 to be expecting to competing for the playoffs in 2025. If you, if that this team gave you hope for that, I think that would be enough to keep Napier around going into next season. We'll see. I mean, obviously Napier and Strickland, we presume that those guys are sort of attached to the hip. Um, Strickland seems to have a lot of support from people in the athletic department, which means that, uh, that, you know, I think Napier and Strickland are going to get time to turn around. Whether that's the right thing or not is, is a different debate, but they're going to get that time. I, I think that what, you know, any sort of business you talk about leading and lagging indicators. And to me, the recruiting and the transfer portal and the organization are all the leading indicators and the lagging indicators of the record. So you're asking me, well, what does the lagging indicator for year three need to be in order to make a choice? And I'm going to say the lagging indicator is the results and all the stuff that leads up to those results are the things that I'm making decisions on, which means that if you're not if, the, if like there are times where teams will take a step up and that lagging indicator will be really, really good. And that will end up sort of overshadowing some of the process missteps that happen along the way. But if you're not going to have the record, then all of a sudden everything else has to be buttoned up. Like all the NIL stuff, all the recruiting, all the transfer portal, all that stuff has to be buttoned up. Yes. So again, I just go back to there's show. other ways to make progress is, is the point. Right. We are now we are now at a show me portion where unfortunately because there's been dysfunction when it's come to those different things that I talk, just talked about yep. the lagging indicator is the only thing we can hang our hat on. You got to win some games, and you know whether that's seven, eight, nine, you know whatever. I think that's going to be individual. I think if you end up five and seven or seven and five, you're having the same argument. 
right? Be- and and I think this is the point you're making is that if if it's five and seven or seven and five, there's still going to be a subset of people who go, I don't want the turnover. I want to see where we go in 2025. The only thing that will be, that will make the people be quiet who want Napier out will be a nine and three, ten and two type of season. The only thing that will that will make people decide that it's time is a three and nine or a two and ten type of season. Mm-hmm. And anything in between is just going to continue this argument for another year until somebody at the top decides to make a change. And we're obviously not privy to the people who are uh, who are making those decisions. And those decisions are going to be made not just on what we see, but also internally what everyone sees as well. Look, I, there's plenty of areas to improve right now. And that's that's I. I guess that's what I'm looking for this year. If we're still seeing a lot of the sloppiness we saw last season, especially, I thought last season that was the most disappointing part. I mean, obviously, wins and losses, you know, that's sim- that's a simple thing to look at. We we like to try to go deeper into why we're losing games and what what's behind all that. The disorganization last year was super disappointing. And I, I think that's something that, like you said, can you button up those other issues? So even that, if that record isn't exactly where we want it, and like I said, I, I'm saying this too, I, I don't care about a six and six record. I don't care about a five and seven record. I, I expect to compete. I want to compete for a championship. So if I have to eat one more of those five and seven, six, five, there's no difference between five and seven and six and six to me. It's you're not, you're not in title contention. It, it's, Title or no title, that's that's kind of the way I look at it with Florida football. We're the type of program where you can look at it like that. So five and seven, seven and five, six, they're kind of all the same. We're not hanging. Uh, so the only, the only the only thing I would argue with on that is that you've had years of six and seven and five and seven, and another five and seven year again means that lagging indicator is suggesting that things are not moving in the right direction. Seven and five at least suggests there's been improvement from last year, and if you, if that goes along with the operational fixes and if that goes along with rating the transfer portal like old miss does and if that goes along with bringing in four or five stars in the 2025 recruiting class well all of a sudden now that seven and five is part of a larger puzzle that you're putting together to justify the hope and the belief that things are going to change if you're six and seven five and seven and five and seven and you're recruiting in the 15s where are we going like if if the if the answer is playoffs or no playoffs and we're basically hinging it on, well, we'll lose to LSU, Georgia, and Florida State, but we might be able to get in at nine and three. Okay, that's fine, but that's not where we want to be. And again, I go back to compared to what, and sometimes you make a change, even if it's un- an uncertain change, because you know and you're certain that what you have is not going to get you where you want to be. And I'm not there with Napier yet. I think there are fans who are there with Napier. And I think after this year, we're going to have a very clear, I I think we're going to have much better lines drawn in terms of whether that's true. And if what we're looking for in 2025, if you're telling me, well, you know, if we go eight and five this year, all of a sudden like that, that'd be real progress. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, let's put the stake in the ground then. So you're saying playoffs in 2025 or we're done. I would think that you have to be a solid playoff contender in 25. Yes. Not contender, not contender. Well, top 12. Because because eight and four is a playoff contender. Because if you lose four games in the SEC, you're going to be in the top 20. So eight and four, like you lose that game to Florida State to go eight and four instead of nine and three, and it leaves you out of the playoff. Well, wait, Are I, we I okay think, with that? Because I, cont- I would make that a contender. The pro again, the problem with where we're at right now with the issues that have gone on on the field and off the field with the NIL stuff is it has ratcheted up the pressure where it, it becomes all about the result right now on the field. Like that mm-hmm. win loss is is everything right now because it's tough. It's tough to justify. You can't put well, the recruiting's going great. No, nothing's gone great to this point. That's I, anyone can be honest about that and say nothing's gone great to this point. And again, it's not a Napier defense. It's not even about Napier. It's about the fact that we've done this turnover thing over and over and over again, and we just don't seem to get it right. So yeah, yeah. I have, point, I have no I, look. I, at some point, like, you got to look I at disagree. it and go, "Is that the answer?" And that, I that's just, I, really my question that I've been asking a lot. And and, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm 100 percent wrong on this. It's just something that has come up in my mind a lot because I've looked at what we've done. You know, when Will Muschamp got fired after after that George Southern loss, I was like, okay, yeah, it's time. McElwain, I, I didn't really get McElwain from the jump, so I'm a bad person to ask. But it definitely, when we were down 42 nothing before halftime against Georgia, it was time. Mullen even, it felt like time because you're looking at the scenario going, the program's just 
cratering. And in some ways, a lot of where we're at still from that era. However, this is Billy Napier's team this year. There's been enough time to get the discipline in. I don't want to see uh, – that's the part I'm going to be less patient with this year is – the issues on the field with the, like, I mean, even the Arkansas game, right? There was, we had the penalty before the missed field goal, right? Something that simple, something that simple, like cost can cost you a game. So I, I don't, I don't understand um, why there's, why there would be urgency on going six and six versus five and seven. Cause either way, like, I don't care if we go to a terrible bowl game or not. That's not, that's not what I'm interested in with this program. So, so I guess what, what I would ask Nick is that, or at least what I would say is that I disagree that the constant turnover is the problem. I think in many ways, the constant turnover is a function of picking the wrong guy. And there's a reason why Jim McElwain has not latched on at South Carolina or, or, or Tennessee or USC and been an outstanding coach there. There's a reason why Will Muschamp went to South Carolina and struggled. There's a reason why Dan Mullen still hasn't gotten back in. I think he will, but I don't know that he'll get like a top tier program like Florida again. I think he'll get a team that's kind of in the Mississippi so state range again he, when he gets an opportunity. So what I'm saying is, is that there are only a few Nick Saban's Kirby smarts, even Ryan days out there, Jim Harbaugh's agreed. So the question, and I think this is a, this is an open question is, are you better off continually searching for him every three or four years, even if you miss versus holding on to somebody for six or seven years and ensuring that you miss because you never took your shot three years in. And that's, I think where I disagree with you a little bit is I think it's probably better and I don't have data to, to back this up yet. And that's one of the things I'll probably I'll bet you that data season. is different in the transfer portal era too. And well, there's no data to actually quicker. pull on, on that. You you can, you can, you can flip it quicker. That, that could be an argument for the, for the making the move part is you can flip it quicker, but that well, works both ways. That's a double edged short. That's not necessarily a good thing. That could also be a bad thing too. Well, so no, no, no. So you didn't let me, you didn't let me finish my thoughts. So that's the first part, right? Is we can have an argument about that. I think it's a good faith argument. I think you and I can disagree. What I want from people in your camp though is I want to know in 2025 what has to happen for it to be deemed successful and we're in the right spot. And you're telling, are you telling me that it has to be playoff or are you telling me it has to be playoff contention? Because if it's playoff contention, I disagree because I think that's a top 20 team and I don't think that's good enough. I think it's playoff. I think you, if, if I'm going to be patient, if I'm going to, the, the phrasing you used was if you're going to eat another five and seven, six and six, seven and five year, you know, cause you don't care about the difference between those. If you're going to eat that, look, I live up in Philadelphia where, where all the fans just like ate the years of the Sixers being terrible so that they could get Joel Embiid. And, you know, they also missed on Markel Fultz. So they missed on some other and Ben Simmons, but they got Embiid, And that's why that team is able to compete at least when he's healthy up here in Philly the fans were willing to eat those years because they saw what was coming on the other side. And what I'm asking is what needs to come in 2025 that makes eating 2024 worth it versus saying at the end of 2024, we're not going to get to where we need to be in 2025. It's time to make a change and see if we can bring someone else in who in year two will be able to get us into that top 20, into that playoff contention type of spot. Because if you're going to tell me we just need to be a top 20 team, I think there are other coaches out there who can do that, even if they're not the Savings and Smarts of the world. Um, and and if Napier hasn't been able to do that by his third year, I'm not sure that I believe he's going to be able to do it by the fourth either. And, so and that's sort okay of the question. you waiting to 2026 with a new guy but you're not okay waiting till 2026 with Napier. Because either way, you're either way, the end result is the same. It, well, but in your scenario, you just presented there, you're still waiting till 2026. And I guess that's my point. You you made the comment, and I agree with you. The problem is, is we're not very good at hiring coaches. It seems like so. Let's go hire more coaches, right? Well, like, so that's, no, 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 no. So, so point, now you have so, to look at it, the the proof is in the pudding here, where 
if we are terrible at identifying coaches, then maybe we should chill on that front and focus on strengthening the program in other areas. So go tell me the other programs that have been awesome at identifying coaches. I mean, you got Georgia who you could say, Oh, they held on to Rick. He was Rick. He was able to build up the program for Kirby smart to take over. Um, but you could also go to Alabama where you're like, they really weren't all that great until Saban came in all of a sudden, boom, you can look at LSU where Saban came in and boom, you can look at a few other, like you look at Tennessee, they were absolutely, they were much, much better year two under Heupel than they were under Jeremy Pruitt. I think there are, um, and, and the other thing is, is that I think the argument that you gave me is, or the position that you put me in there where I'm willing to wait till 2026, I'm willing to wait until 2026 because of the leading indicators. If Billy Napier had three straight top five recruiting classes, I wouldn't care what the results are on the field because I know they're coming. And right. honestly, that was always the point I made about Georgia. I've got an article from, I think, 2020 on my on my website when Carson Beck committed to Georgia. And it's it's called <laughs> the oncoming Georgia title wave is like the name of the article. And the point was, yeah, Kirby's yacked a couple of games against against Alabama. Yeah, he made some really questionable calls against Tennessee in his first year. Yeah, they lost to Vanderbilt. There are some there are some hiccups there. Absolutely. But he's building an arsenal. You can see the arsenal that he's building. And at some point the arsenal will outweigh any sort of coaching limitation that that guy has now it turns out he's actually done a pretty good job like the timeout that he called um in the national championship game or in the playoff game um that it's ohio, like ohio state the, the same that saved, the saved his team yeah um you know those sorts good of things call. like i think a lot of that stuff has sort of resolved itself but let's be honest one of the reasons why kirby smart's a great coach is because teams always win by 40 points and the reason they're always winning by 40 points is he's built a machine you could see that coming the leading indicators told you that the record was going to turn around and i don't see any any leading indicators that say turnaround. So if you look at this and go, all right, well, Billy Napier, you got to wait till 2026 for Napier. Yeah. But I don't think 2026, if everything stays the same and if we don't see significant improvement on the field, I don't see leading in or leading indicators that indicate the lagging indicators are going to change. And that's, that's the issue is you've got to show me or show the people who are making the decisions, not me because I don't make the decisions. You got to show people who are making the decisions that either you're winning on the field or all the stuff outside of that is turning in the right direction. And now look, if he does that in the next year, cool. I will be the first person to sit up here and say, things have changed. I'm a guy who right before the recruiting class fell apart, go went, in the history of recruiting, no recruiting class has fallen apart after this point. It's a top three class. Get off his back. And then the whole thing fell apart. So, so it's like, Again, but is that just... a Napier problem or is that a program problem? Is that, is that beyond Billy Napier? Cause do you think eight guys just hated Billy Napier with one month ago? Or do you think that's a program issue? Now, Billy Napier is, is the head of the program. And obviously the buck stops with him. I get it. I promise you, I get it. I'm not trying to just make this a Billy Napier defense coach. But you look at the bigger problems in Florida. You talk, Hey, Dan Mullen did an interview last week where he's talking about facilities, which I know everybody loves hearing Dan Mullen's opinion on this stuff right now. But it, you know what? McElwain had complaints about facilities. And at the time, that's where the arms race was. But it always seems like we, we are lagging as a program in, in general on a lot of these things and it seems to be a program thing more than a coach thing and that's where my focus is what can we do better as a program instead of just going the easy things to look at the coach well we've done that for 10 plus years now and maybe we need to take a different approach to, the, to solving the problem because we all want to be championship contenders but it, i'm not i'm not looking to get in the weeds and argue about is this a good five and seven or is this a good six and six because they all suck I, I i'm not saying any of that's good and I, I'm with you, Will, with all the all the indicators of the past. I I, I hear you uh, on that. Although, where, where's your lagway indicator? Your lagging indicators aren't there. Is your lagway indicator any good? We'll see yeah. how much he plays this year. Yeah, again. And that's, to Wonderlick's point, like hopefully we get to see a lot of what's in store for, for 2025. And I think that would be in Billy Napier's best interest to do that as well uh, this season. But Certainly an interesting debate that we can continue uh, throughout the off season here. And I, I, de I will definitely get the point, but unless that home run guys there, um, Nick Saban might want to come out of retirement. Well, maybe, right. Unless the home run guys there, who knows might be more of the same. We'll see. All right. Uh, 
let's go on. We got an article from Nick uh, Marcinko from Gators, Gator Country as well, talking to Ron Roberts. I know we've talked about Roberts a little bit uh, this offseason, but a little more uh, of an insight into his mindset where he really talks about emphasizing tackling. He says, we got, we've got to emphasize tackling. Uh, we've got to be great in that category. Uh, that's what the game's all about. That's what the game's all about. You do all the right stuff. You can draw it up. But if you can't tackle them and get them to, to the ground, it's kind of a problem. So we'll focus on those basics and those fundamentals and make sure we're getting better as a group. Uh, Marcinko's article goes on to say tackling has been a major issue for the Gators defense posting a tackling grade of 59.1 in 2023, which ranked 111th in college football. Florida had 116 missed tackles across 12 games. It hurts me to read that will and 132 across 13 games in 2022. So just not a secret that we haven't been a great tackling team the last couple of years, but this certainly highlights just how bad it's been. Yeah. I mean, I think the the thing that I sort of took away from what Roberts was talking about is they asked him about his, they asked him about the schedule and he basically was like, look, this is where you come. Like you come to Florida for a schedule like this. We're not going to use it as an excuse. The, those sorts of things. Like that's the attitude that I want to see in terms of the team. I mean, you would hope that the team would have a chip on its shoulder that folks like us are talking about, Oh, job security and that sort of stuff. Go win 10 games and nothing. Like nobody says anything about job security at that point. Um, I think the big thing is, you know, he had really nice things to say about Austin Armstrong. Um, you know, he talked about him being brilliant, said he's going to go wherever he wants to go in this, in this profession. Now the interesting part is, is that did mean that uh, Robert has to come in to quote coach the coaches is what Napier said. <laughs> and Armstrong's obviously a young dude and probably needs a little bit of help, but um, you know, this still doesn't go to resolve the questions that I have when it comes to defensive coordinator, which is what it really comes down to it who's going to make the call right who's going to be responsible and um you know if things start going south what happens in that room now hopefully everything goes well that we see a giant improvement that armstrong gets a ton of the credit for doing that as well we see the big plays sort of go away there's there's a feature we'll have in our preseason magazine that talks about the defense um th there there's one specific stat that i think is important that we'll talk about in there where where florida's defense was an outlier in terms of they had a specific statistic that was good but when it comes to actual performance, it didn't correlate the way it normally does. That's going to, I think that's going to change this year. And I think naturally is going to make them be better than they were last year, but obviously better than they were last year. Isn't the goal. Um, <laughs> like all these guys, they brought in the transfer portal, all the guys are bringing in from experience, from an experience perspective, the back end of the defense, specifically the safeties in the corners. Um, we expect them to be a lot better this year. I think Roberts will be a big part of that, but I think part of that is just that attitude. It's, it's not, woe is me. We got those five games at the end of the year. It's we've got those five games at the end of the year. And that's an opportunity. Go whip Ole Miss, go whip Florida state, go be competitive or beat Georgia, go whip LSU and all go whip Texas or at least play, you know, go three and two in those games. And if you end up going eight and four, everybody's patting you on the back. And if you happen to start out the season six and one before you end up in that five, five game run, and you go three and two. Now you're in the playoff. And, and again, schlubs like us, or like me at least are going, Oh, I always said you should be patient. That's the way to build a program. All those Todd um, Golden fans out there, right? <laughs> well, never I mean, doubted him for a second. Never well, this doubted is good. him for a second. This is Golden's second year. Um, and the other thing is for I, a 10 I, minute for a 12 man roster, but okay. Well, there, there was a guy on, uh, on, uh, Twitter who was asking me, you know, does this, does this sort of suggest that Napier should have spent more time building through the transfer portal and, you know, he, he, all the caveats prisoner of the moment. So that was a polite question. And I think the answer that I gave was there's just different expectations, like getting to the sec, the sec tournament championship and losing to an Auburn like Florida did is considered success for the basketball program. Now, maybe getting to the SEC championship game at Florida and losing would be considered success, but it wasn't for Dan Mullen, certainly wasn't for Jim McElwain. And so there's just a different set of expectations. And so how you're going to build things, um, you're going to have to build it on the, on the back of these difficult schedules um, if you're going to slip up more than twice. And, you know, I've said this a few times this year, is Florida's schedule, normally we would look at it and go, this is awesome. Like, for two reasons. One is the number of awesome games we'll have. If Florida's good the whole year, the number of awesome games we're going to have to cover is going to be fantastic. 
But the other part of it is, is you are allowed to slip up with the 12 team playoff. Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to have to go 13 and 0 and get left out. Like you, you're going to be able to go 10 and two or nine and three. If you went nine and three against the schedule we have, you'd be a guaranteed playoff team. I think so. Now, I mean, obviously the good part is the SEC has like 11 of the 12 teams when it comes to the playoff based on contractual obligations. So, (laughs) um, you know, it's, uh, I guess you're trying to negotiate that one. The big 10 gets one, the SEC gets 11. <laughs> and then uh, everybody else gets told to take a hike. But uh, no, I, I think I look, I think the defense, like I said, it's going to get better just on statistical anomalies alone. But I think having a 56 year old guy, I think Robert's 56. I think having a guy that age who can come in and sort of stabilize things when things start to go a little bit downhill is going to be a valuable thing. I, I think, it was interesting. I thought Florida in the first three or four games of the year last year played pretty well on defense. I think statistically, maybe not great, but there was a play specifically where they were prepared for a fourth down double slant by Tennessee. And that was something I looked at and I went, the guys knew where to be and they were in the right spot and it disrupted the play. And I think it was Jordan Castell who's actually the one who was there. So you get a true freshman in the right spot in a big spot in a game against Tennessee. That's big time right there. The defensive coordinator has a true freshman prepared for that moment. The problem is, is when things start to go a little bit downhill, you know, four or five, six games in, and they just never seem to be able to recover. It was one of those things where their confidence was shot, their heads went down, they didn't trust their their teammates, and all of a sudden people are just running all over them. You can see the same thing at LSU, right? So it's not like it's just a Florida thing. And the hope that I have is that Roberts is going to bring that kind of steadying influence where he's like, look, we're going to flush that game. Because that game doesn't dictate what happens in this one. So now we're playing an Arkansas team with a terrible offense. Don't let the 50 points or the 45 points you gave to Georgia enable 40 points from 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 Arkansas. I mean, Arkansas's offense was terrible last year against everybody but Florida. And I think that sort of indicates that there's a carryover game to game that Roberts hopefully is going to be able to stop. That's our second reference to the Arkansas game. We'll stop torturing people. No more <laughs> Arkansas game references. The rest of the episode, we promise. Um, all right. Well, that's a good look, uh, from some good articles out there on Gator country. Be sure to check out those guys. We really enjoy their stuff. Uh, all right, let's move on here to Marcus Bowman. No longer on the roster at UCF. Uh, will former five-star running back here from Lakeland, obviously it has a hell of a high school film. I loved watching his clips from high school. Uh, went up to Clemson, transferred down to Florida under Dan Mullen. Didn't work out. Ended up over at UCF. So, well, is this a win for the stars don't matter crowd? Uh, I mean, I guess it's a win from the standpoint of a five star did not deliver the promise that you expected. But interestingly, I did go back and look at that 2020 class. And there's some caveats here, which is that um, which is that not all the players who were in the top tier for that 2020 class are have had an opportunity to be drafted. So a guy like DJ, DJ Ue Agalele was in the top 30. He hasn't been drafted yet because he hasn't entered the draft. Um, but that's true no matter where you look in the rankings. So I went back and looked because I was curious after I saw a few people – snarkily putting that that this was a win for um, people who say stars don't matter. So the 24-7 composite ranking, I looked at the players ranked 1 through 30, players ranked 31 through 60, and the players ranked 61 through 90. So thus far, 18 guys in the fir- in the top 30 have been drafted compared to five in 31 through 60 and five 61 through 90. Nine first rounders out of the out of those 18 for one through 30. The average round is 2.7. The average pick is 72. 60% of those guys have already been drafted um, compared to 17% for the um, guys ranked 31 through 60 and guys ranked 61 through 90. So when we talk about the top tier five star guys, this is what we mean. We mean that 60% of those guys have already been drafted. Nine of them have gone in the first round. So a third of them, nine out of 30, have gone in the first round. Um, that's that's significant value. Like if you're talking about NIL and you're talking about money that you're putting towards players, this is actually where I think Napier got it right this year because DJ Lagway and LJ McCray fall well within that one through 30 range. 
and paying for a guy ranked, say, 62nd or a guy ranked 93rd or a guy ranked 150th doesn't make a whole lot of sense given the payoff. I mean, again, it comes back to that question of compared to what, right? But if you have an alternative guy who's ranked 250 versus a guy who's ranked 25 or even a guy who's ranked 90th versus a guy who's ranked 60th, like take the guy who's 90th if they cost, if the guy who's 90th costs less money than the guy who costs 60th because we're talking about resource allocation. So, in terms of where the resources were allocated this year, the only one you might quibble with is Xavier Filsimi. But Filsimi goes to Texas. I think he wound up ranked in like the 40th range overall in the 24-7 composite. So again, he didn't fit within that top tier when you look at the end of it as well. Um, so no, DeMarcus Bowman washing out from three different programs does not suggest that stars don't matter. What it suggests is that a five-star ranking does not guarantee success and that you still have to do evaluations. You still have to know the kid. You got to avoid injuries. Um, you know, there's all those different things that go in to it. However, again, you go back to 2020, nine of the top 30 guys got drafted in the first round and 18 of them got drafted overall. It's a pretty, uh, compared to five in the next two bins for 31 through 60 and 61 through 90, pretty solid indicator that uh, the, the stars do matter, at least when it comes to the five stars. Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say so. I think the numbers have been there. I, I've read enough Will Miles articles at this point. So... Well, I mean, but that's the thing, right? So like Baker Mayfield wins the Heisman and everybody's like, look, he was a three star. Like you don't need five stars. That's absolutely true. But it also takes a lot of credit away from a guy like Baker Mayfield who wins the Heisman trophy and has beat the odds, right? Because he's a guy who's one of, I mean, I don't I think there's 1400 three stars every year and he's one of those 1400 guys. And how many of those 1400 guys end up all Americans or, or Heisman trophy winners and those sorts of things. It's or drafted in the NFL and Baker Mayfield just signed a huge contract with the Buccaneers. He's parlayed that three-star ranking into an awful lot of money and an awful lot of accolades and good for him. But part of that is, is that he has defeat, he has beaten the odds. And I think when you sit there and say stars don't matter, what you're doing is you're sort of downplaying the development and the, the grit and all the stuff that Baker Mayfield had to put into it in order to be successful. Same thing with Kyle Trask at Florida. Um, same thing with a lot of other players who are out there as well. So, and look, that doesn't mean that you don't end up with stars who are ranked 120th. I mean, Kyle Pitts was ranked around 120th, one of the best tight ends we've ever seen in the game. It's not that those guys can't be outstanding. It's that the percentage at which they become outstanding is significantly less. And so when you have an opportunity to snatch one up, you need to do it. It's just not always going to work out. And that's one of the unfortunate parts of it. But if you give me a six in 10 shot of a guy getting drafted versus a one in nine shot of a guy getting drafted, I know which one I'm taking, right? And so if you give me a guy ranked 45th and you give me a guy ranked 5th, the guy ranked 5th is going to get drafted more often. That's the guy you want to focus on, spend your resources on, and uh, and cultivate. And if it doesn't work out, well, that's a problem, but um it's not because of the it's not because of the rankings. No question, no question. All right, let's move on here to the final topic. All right, in honor of March Madness out this week and nice run by the Gator basketball team. By the way, we're not we're not a basketball podcast. We're not going to waste a lot of time on it here. But Will, what'd you think about the Gators uh, run up in Nashville? Well, I mean, obviously, it was kind of cool to see them to see them play well. I think we've seen them play well all year. They've also played down in their competition, lost to a couple of a uh, couple of guys they shouldn't have. Um, you know, obviously, our prayers go out to to Micah Handglotten, who oh. just just absolutely, you know, a horrible, horrible injury. Hopefully, uh, everything goes well. I'm assuming he's going to need surgery, and that surgery goes well, and we'll have him back at some point next year. But uh, you know, hopefully, you know, you never want to see an injury like that. But hopefully, the team's able to sort of rally around it. Feel like they got screwed a little bit when it came to the seventh seed that they got, considering that Alabama was a fourth. Um, and there are some other comparisons you can make that should have suggested they'd be at least on the sixth line. So the fact that they're a seven seed, maybe there's a chip on their shoulder. And if they get past that first round game, that you know they've they've shown they can play with anybody. And so I'm interested to see what happens, and maybe they can make a run to that Sweet 16, Elite Eight, even Final Four if they get a little bit lucky in terms of their draw. Yeah, I think uh, round two potentially against Shaka Smart, former Billy Donovan assistant, right? Shaka Smart and Marquette. Hey man, time to go. It's this. This 
like you said, we're not a basketball podcast, but this is when it becomes fun, right? Is you got to start thinking about, am I going to take Thursday or Friday off of work and stay home and watch these games? And, oh, did I, did I get a little cough, <coughs> a little cough that, I'm, that I <laughs> might be out on Friday? Um, I didn't say that at all. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, good. You're advertising it on the internet. So that's, uh, uh it's all good, man. <laughs> I'll, I got vacation. I'll take a vacation day if I want to be home on Friday. All right. Well, in honor of, March Madness in the brackets. We want to know your final four. Put in the comments section here the four best non quarterback players since 1990 for Florida football. The four best non quarterback players. Put it in the comments there. We want to hear names. You go back, you know, some of you old, older Gators could put names like Kevin Carter, Chris Doring, and we're cutting it off at 1990. We're cutting it off in 1990, but Kevin Carter, Chris Doring, Jason Odom, Rydell Anthony, I kill you, all those great players from the 90s. Maybe you're more from the Urban Meyer era, something like an Andre Caldwell, the Pouncey Brothers, Percy Harvin is probably going to be on a lot of lists there. Well, Spikes, Ahmad Black. Hey, maybe we even got a Chaz Henry fan out there or two. Huh? Are we throwing a punter on that list? I, I don't I don't know. I don't know about that, but you know, we'll Delatorial will we'll, we'll chime in and put a punter on there. <laughs> yeah, it, Kyle Pitts is one that you you, yeah, you know, recent days. enough. Canarius Tony, Osiris Torrance, a unanimous All American. Um, you got obviously the the Anthony Hilliard and Green, but Fred Weary, Fred Taylor. Is somebody, you know, obviously an NFL Hall of Famer, but he was a big time deal. Um, Reggie Nelson, Jared Davis, Antonio Morrison. Um, I don't know if you mentioned Alex Brown and Javon Kurse, uh, but those are, you know, look, I'm sure there are people we've left off, but we started Funny. sort of doing the exercise of who our top four would be. And we were like, like, how are we actually, how are we actually metricing this? I mean, look, Jonathan Grenard was there for one year. But it was a hell of a year when he was there. And so how do you evaluate that? How do you look at that? Obviously, college football has changed from 1990. But I'd be interested to see. And obviously, we we eliminated the quarterbacks because then it'd be like, you know, Tebow, Spurrier. Well, Spurrier's not, not, pre, or not post-1990, but it'd be, you know, Tebow, Werfel, Grossman, and then who else? And it's like, okay, maybe you even put Trask on there, right? And all of, right or right. you mentioned Cam Newton. <laughs> like, does he count <laughs> as, as an elite Florida quarterback? So, uh, yeah, we'd love to hear everybody's comments. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm curious. I'm sure we missed some, um, and I'm sure there are folks out there. Uh, you know, my one of my personal favorites, Phil Troutwine, was somebody who's a big time deal back there in 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 some for some of those teams, and uh, you know. Aaron Hernandez is a guy as well. Obviously, there's some baggage there, but one of the best tight ends has come through Florida. So, um, you know, I'm interested to see what people say. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, next year maybe we'll have brackets or something for this. People can vote on it. Yeah. For now, we just want to hear people's final four. Just put it in the comment section. We'll read off some of those comments next week and we'll uh, put our own list up as well. So we'll check in next week. Thank you everybody for joining us for Will Miles. I'm Nick Newton. Have a great week, everybody and go Gators. Hey everybody. Thanks for listening to stand up and holler. If you're interested in more information from me and Nick, you can go over to read and You can like, and subscribe our YouTube channel here at read and reaction, or you can go to patreon.com slash read and reaction to support us, get extra information. And we do ask any things over there every once in a while as well. So check us out. Thanks for listening.